Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh, fresh water. Oh, well, Jess, thank you so much for that reading. For those of you who may be new or visiting this live stream, my name's Jitesh on the staff team here at Holy Trinity. It's my great joy just to be continuing our series in the book of James. And I hope if you've been with us regularly, you've just been really excited by what we've been encountering in it, how James just really speaks the heart of our lives and the reality of them. Well, um, our passage today begins with these words. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. Well, I, I sometimes feel like I should stop right there when I read words like that and get off the platform and not speak. Uh, those are words that should cause us to pause, to actually say, actually, what we do in this moment isn't a light thing, that actually we're asking God to speak. And so let's pray for that as we just dig into this passage. Lord God, we just want to humble ourselves and recognize that you are a speaking God. And I pray for myself that the words that I would speak would be pleasing in your sight and true according to your voice. And I pray that we who hear your word might have right ears to hear it and to receive it and to obey it and to walk in the way that you want us to walk as a result. We pray these things in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Well, the reason James says that not many of you should become teachers, not many of us should become teachers, is because of the power of what they use when they teach and when they preach. And it's the power of this, it's the power of the tongue that actually can unleash the most wonderful power for good, but also for evil. And you shouldn't run too hastily into wanting to use it in the place of preaching and teaching. But then he actually connects it to every single one of us and says that every single one of us have tongues and that actually for us, we have the same capacity and power and the same fearsome responsibility. Verse 2, he says this, We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect able to keep their whole body in check. What he's saying, in effect, is that our tongues act like spiritual gauges to see what's really going on with our lives. That actually the tongue literally says it all. Je Jesus says in the Gospels, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Many of you know that doctors, even until, up until recently, in routine examinations would ask you to stick out your tongue so that they could look at it. Because by looking at tongues, you can tell a lot. You can tell diseases and deficiencies and even cancers. 
And James is saying in this passage, stick out your tongue. Look at it in the mirror and you'll see stuff. And that stuff should terrify you. That actually there's stuff that needs sorting out. It says it as it really is. The tongue says it all. A number of years ago, before I became a minister, I'd just been accepted for training into the priesthood. And I was feeling the real weight and the responsibility of that burden falling on my shoulders. And so with a friend of mine, decided to go up to the northern reaches of Scotland to a Benedictine monastery for a three-day silent Uh, fasting prayer retreat, hardcore. And when I got there, I met these amazing Benedictine monks who wore these long flowing white robes, looked spectacular. And as I got to see what they did, I heard about how they would get up before dawn and actually heard them get up before dawn to pray together. And then seven seven times every single day, they'd gather together to pray. And they just committed their lives to prayer and to the study of Scripture and to each other and to welcoming in people around them. And I thought, these guys are the real deal. They're the holy men of God. I want to be like them. But then actually, during that retreat, as I was just walking around the garden, I overheard two of them speaking normally for the very first time. And what came out of their mouth was just lewdness and crudeness and lust and ridicule. And suddenly... The bubble was burst. Oh, they're just like everyone else. They're actually, the tongue just says it all. And James says in our passage, if you stick out your tongue, if you look at it in the mirror, you're going to, you're going to see two things about it that should cause us concern. And the first thing he, he says is that when we look at our tongues, we're to realize that our tongues are those that cause trouble. That they cause trouble. You'll have heard the old saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And James says, actually, that's a complete lie. Words have the power to hurt. They have the power to destroy, to cause lasting damage. And he shows this by equating the power of our tongue to three pictures that he gives. The first picture is of a rampaging, powerful horse that's just controlled by a tiny bit in its mouth. And he's saying that the sheer power It's channeled by just a tiny little thing. And that's what our tongues are like. The sheer power of our entire lives just channeled by that tiny little thing that pours it out. Then he gives the analogy of a ship, a huge ship that's controlled by just a tiny rudder. And even today, half a million ton oil tankers are controlled by rudders that are just under a tenth of a percent of their entire weight. Serious amounts of force controlled by something that's really small. And verse 5, he says, that's what our tongues are like. That's the scale-up effect of our tongues. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. That actually many of us can look back at times where just the smallest of words have been said to us, and yet they've had that capacity and power to utterly ruin us and shatter us. Those words from a loved one or a friend or a teacher or that bully that have just penetrated in and caused lasting damage. Our words can do the most awful of things. He goes on to speak about it being like a wild forest fire that's lit by just a single spark. That How in certain countries in the world, entire regions and areas are devastated for weeks on end by forest fires that are just started by a single spark, a single discarded match. And we've seen in the media recently how just a single errant sentence or tweet can cause uprising and violence and revolts. But actually that's true in our own lives. Those loose words, those silly remarks, the things that we shouldn't have said, that we wish we hadn't have said, but we did say that actually they can just take on a life of their own, unintended consequences that can really penetrate and hurt others, even those that we love the most. And James is saying again and again and again, realize just how powerful this thing is that's in your mouth. Realize what devastation it can unleash. And my own experience in ministry is that when I've been helping to encourage and minister to those who've been tormented, really, by mental and emotional struggles, so often in the midst of deep prayer ministry, what God reveals is a word that's been spoken. 
just one or two sometimes that have just penetrated and shattered them from the inside out and is continually churning away on the inside, causing hurt. And the Lord just reveals that and ministers to it because he loves doing that. But that's what our words can do in people's lives. King Solomon in Proverbs 18 says that death and life are in the power of our tongues. We may think that we're inconsequential. We might think that our words are inconsequential. But for all of us, they have consequence. We have to realize that this thing can cause such great trouble. And then the second thing that James says is that not only can our tongues cause trouble, but ultimately they're in trouble. He says it's worse than you realize. Verse 6, the tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, as, and is itself set on fire by hell. He doesn't mince his words, does he? That's James's way. He says it like it is. He says that actually the reason that your tongues can cause such evil and devastation and destruction is because they're infected by evil and devastation and destruction in the first place. And they spread aboard what they're already infected with. And evil is as evil speaks. And to give true proof of that, he, he, he points to the fact that in the natural world, we've been able to tame just about all kinds of different kinds of animals and species. We've been able to subjugate them and control them, what they, what they do and how they react to things. But actually, what does he say in verse 8? But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. I wonder how many of us, even today, have said things to those whom we love the most that we wish we hadn't. Or even this weekend or this week. What is that? Why do we keep on doing that? It's because our tongues aren't just under our control. That they're under the control of something else. That they're infected by this evil. They're fallen and fickle. And they really need saving. It's really interesting that for a number of years as a younger adult, I spent time living in Oxford, educated and elite and refined. But it was fascinating to find out that even in a city like that, that education hadn't actually taken away the evil that was present on people's tongues. In fact, sometimes it just amplified it. That actually, it wasn't that the tongues no longer spoke evil that we'd recognize, but they just spoke them sometimes in clever words and longer senses and snide remarks, just evil that is masked in different ways. And that's what the tongue just is. It's just so infected by the fall that nothing can change it. But like in the king's speech, you can have the most amazing speech therapy to change the way that you speak. And praise God for speech therapists. But there's no therapy to change what you speak, the evil that comes out. And at this point, you might be tempted to object and say to James, James, that's too heavy. Look, my tongue also does a lot of good. I say lots of great things as well that encourage people and do good, not harm. And what James says to that is, well, that should just highlight it even further, that your tongue is such a mixed enterprise, that it's so fallen, and that the good it does is just to contrast and highlight that. He says, verse 9, with the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. That our tongues we've just used in worship, singing God's praise that Pedro and Stephanie have been leading us in so wonderfully. But at the same time, at some point this week, no doubt we've used it to slander others, to speak ill of them. And James says, don't you realize by seeing that, what state your tongue is really in. He says that our tongues are like springs of water that give forth both fresh water and salty water, both life-giving words and poisonous words. That they're like trees that seem to give one fruit, but actually so often give another. And it shouldn't be so, but it is. Because they're utterly fallen and infected with evil. They're in real trouble. 
And James wonderfully and fascinatingly ends our passage without giving us a solution. He's like a doctor that's actually diagnosed the condition but not prescribed the remedy. And you might be tempted at this point to take a vow of silence saying, I'm never going to speak again if that's what my tongue leads to. And that's certainly what the earliest Christian monks, actually, the Desert Fathers, used to do. In fact, some of them used to put stones in their mouths to make sure that they didn't let the sin that was within leak out in their words. That's just not practical. And actually, I think what James so often does for us and what he's hinting at is that actually we need to run to the person that can sort it out. We need to run to the person that can save it. We need to run to the person that can transform it. We need to run to Jesus. He says, reminding you, verse 8, no human being can tame the tongue, but he's the one that can. Verse 2, it speaks about the one who's never at fault in what they say as being perfect, and he's the one that was never at fault in what he said, who had perfect control over his tongue, so he can tame it, and he can work inside of us and transform them from the inside out. The Holy Spirit, Jesus at work in us right now, by his holy presence, can give us, of course, the gift of tongues, that new language in that way, and it's a wonderful thing. But also, he can also give us a new language by transforming our natural tongues and changing them and making them fit for his purposes and wiping away the evil and the sin that has so infected them. We see how he did, he did this with Peter. He took a Christ-denying tongue and transformed it into a tongue that proclaimed his glory. He took Paul's blaspheming tongue and took it in and transformed it into a tongue that worshipped and led to the worship of the Gentiles. And he can take our tongue and transform it for his glory. I want to end with this. Earlier in the last week, an announcement was made that Egyptologists, archaeologists in Egypt had discovered a wonderful new mummy that had been buried in the ground. They'd been looking for the mummy of Queen Cleopatra, who many of us will know. Someone who's famed both for their beauty, but also for their evil and manipulative, wicked tongue. And searching for it, they didn't find her tomb, but they found the tomb of another queen of Egypt. And this tomb and this mummy was remarkable, because when they opened up the sarcophagus, They saw that someone, when the queen was buried, had put a tongue of pure gold into this person's mouth. And now, thousands of years later, everything around it had rotted away. The body had rotted away. But this tongue had remained beautiful and golden and glorious. And think about it. They were looking for the tongue, the the person who's known for their wickedness of tongue. But instead, they found this beautiful tongue. I think that's what Jesus wants to do in our lives. He wants to put a tongue of gold into our mouths. He wants to transform our tongues. He wants to take hold of them. He wants to tame them as only he can and transform them and use them for his glory. He says to us, stick out your tongue, see what they're like, but then give them to me that I might utterly change them and use them. Amen. Come over to you.